Hey and welcome back to my channel. I'm Matt the Printing Nerd and today I want to show you how to assemble the tool head of the 100. Let's start with the printing orientation first. There are a couple of things to keep in mind. First, a general tip. Many parts of the printer contain heat inserts. If you print the parts with supports enabled at standard settings, many slicers want to insert support structures into them. This causes much overhead on cleaning of the parts and in much cases it's not necessary. Therefore, I recommend you to set the minimum support area to 15 square millimeters in your slicer settings. This causes the slicer to ignore small structures like the heat inserts. Next, the orientation of the rod carriage. Here, it's important that the carriage is printed lying on its side. Because if you print it lying on the back, it might happen that your cooling system is not able to cool the filament fast enough and the holders for the dry lens become oval as a result. When the holders are oval, they apply too much pressure on the dry lens and at the end it leads to blocking on the carriage. Next, we have the fan ducts. You should print them upside down. This may be a bit unintuitive, but the lower part of the fan ducts can be printed without supports without any problems. This saves us a lot of fiddling when removing the supports, since otherwise we would have to separate the supports from the fan ducts, which would be tedious. To make sure that no supports are generated in the duct, add a support blocker in the slicer that includes the entire lower part of the fan duct. The orientation of the hot end holder is also important. Here it's important that the holder and the bracket are printed lying on their backs. This ensures that the hot end can be fixed precisely in the tool head mount. For example, if you were to print the part upright, you would need support structures so that the bracket for the hot end could be printed properly. After removing the support structures, residue will remain on the holder, which can be difficult to remove and may result in the hot end not fitting in the holder. Okay, after we have cleaned all parts from the supports, we come to the heat inserts. For this, you need a soldering iron, which we set to maximum temperature. As soon as this is warm, we can start. To do this, we take a heat insert and press it into a hole in our part. When designing the parts, I made sure that the holes for the heat inserts are large enough that they snap into the holes and don't have to be held while inserting. Now take the soldering iron and touch the heat insert with it. Don't press it in. Be gentle and wait. The heat from the soldering iron will warm it up and as it melts the PLA, it will slowly sink into the part. This means that the holding power of the heat insert will be stronger because the material was liquid enough to wrap around it. When the heat insert is sunk about 80% into the part, we remove the soldering iron and grab a tool to press it into its final position. For me, it's this motherboard box. I press on it, hold it briefly, wiggle a little, and here we go. We have a perfectly straight heat insert. Now we have to repeat this a dozen times. To screw the blower fans into the fan duct, it's important to also add heat inserts into them. We proceed with the fans in the same way as with the other parts. The only important thing here is that we insert the heat inserts into the correct side of the fans. One fan on the back, the other one in the front. Another tip I want to give you is about the motors of the fans. If you look at the solder joints on the motor, we can see a small piece of cable between the joint and the insulation is exposed. Now, if we print fast, vibrations are created which affect the cable and the small exposed piece becomes a breaking point. To prevent this, we glue these solder points on all the fans we use. 
You may use normal super glue for this or hot glue, whatever you have ready. It's important that you put a thick layer on it so that the cable is supported by the adhesive. If you use too much glue, scrape it off to avoid bumps. This is especially important for the 4010 fan because it has to be inserted into a small housing later. Next, I would like to give you a brief overview of where we have installed heat inserts. First, the tool head mount. Here, we added two heat inserts in the front. The two are only used in the CHC Pro Volcano variant. The regular CHC mount uses longer screws, so no heat inserts are needed. This one is also attached with four screws, while the Pro version only requires two of them. Next, we have the rod carriage. Here, we have two heat inserts on the top, four heat inserts on the front, and two on the bottom. In the fan duct, we have two heat inserts on the back and two on the top. We will use the two upper heat inserts in the tuning phase to attach an accelerometer to the printhead to measure vibration. Okay, next I want to talk a little bit about how to choose rods and dry lens for the x-axis. The best way to test this is to take a rod and slide various dry lens over it. You can recognize a well-fitting dry lens when it has no play on the rod. Also, make sure that the dry lens has no sharp edges. You can feel the best when you slide the dry lens onto the rod. Look out for scratching or resistance that can be overcome with a little force. Both are signs for a bad dry lens. Now that we found a good combination of dry lens and rod, slide the dry lens back and forth a bit. You should feel a slight resistance as if the dry lens is sticking on the rod. Now repeat this with a second rod and find another suitable dry lens. And we are ready to assemble the carriage. In my previous video, many of you asked if it's possible to use steel bearings instead of dry lens. And yes, that's possible. However, it has to be said that these ones can be very loud, especially if you want to print fast. The tolerances for steel bearings are slightly larger than for dry lens. Still, make sure that you choose the ones that have the least amount of play. Let's compare the noise level between those two options. First, the steel bearings. As you can hear, they produce a high-pitched whistling sound even at slower speeds. Next, the dry lens. Those are almost silent at slow speeds and even when printing faster, the sound is much more quieter and much more pleasant to the ear. With this build, we stick to the build of materials and therefore choose the dry lens. Dry lens work best under tension. Therefore, I've designed the sockets a little bit smaller to put static pressure onto them. As you can see, force is required to push the dry lens into the socket. With the help of a second dry lens, we push the first one to the center of its socket. Now, we repeat the whole process a second time, and then we are ready to test the fitting. Take a rod and push it through the dry lens. You should notice that the resistance has now increased a bit. Next, let's have a look at the belt holders. Since we printed the carriage on the side, it can happen that the belts cannot be fed through properly due printing errors. So we should check the clearance before we assemble the carriage. Here I have a short piece of belt and I'm trying to push it through every hole. Since the inside of the holes is rounded, the belt should go through the hole without too much pushing force. After we have verified that the belts fit, the rod carriage is complete and we are ready for assembly. In the first step, we attach the hot end holder to the rod carriage. We do this by screwing the holder into the bottom two heat inserts of the rod carriage with two M3 6mm screws. Next, we attach the connecting plate to the rod carriage. We do this by screwing the plate into the two lower heat inserts of the rod carriage with two M6 6mm screws. Next, we assemble the hot end. In order to fit the hot end in the tool head, it's necessary that we remove the arm that is holding the cables. Otherwise, the arm would reach into the cooling fan and it would not longer be able to rotate. Without the arm, we can bend the cables straight up without touching the cooling fan at all. First, we cut through the cable tie with a cutter and remove the silicon sock. Next, we remove the screw. Therefore, a very small Allen wrench is required. When the screw is out, we remove the arm and put back the silicon sock on the heater. Next step is to assemble the melting path. First, we screw the heat break in up to the point where the threads end. The CHC Pro Volcano comes with a V6 Volcano nozzle. 
This nozzle is able to melt 25 to 28 cubic millimeters. For the 100, we want to go even higher flow rate. Therefore, we don't use this nozzle. Instead, we use a combination of Volcano Extender and CHT nozzle. You can go with the original one or use a knockoff variant. Both have a similar flow in this configuration. The Volcano adapter has two sides. One is rounded, the other one has the Allen wrench shape. Screw the adapter into the heater so that the Allen wrench side looks to the outside. Use a M3 Allen wrench to screw it until it presses onto the heat brake. After that, you screw the CHT nozzle in. At last, we screw the cooling fins onto the heat brake and the hot end is almost finished. Since we use this hot end in a Bowden setup, we have to attach the Bowden connector and the clamp to fix the Bowden tube onto the hot end. After we have assembled the hot end, we can attach it to the rod carriage. The hot end should snap into the holder with a little bit of pressure. Now we turn the hot end in the holder so that the cables run along the right side of the holder. Finally, we fix the hot end with a clamp. For this, we use two M3 12mm screws. The last part we need to assemble before the tool head is complete is the fan duct. For this, we take the 4010 fan and push it into the pocket at the top of the fan duct and push it all the way through. Some force may be required here. When the fan is in position, we thread the hot end cables through the fan duct. After that, the rod carriage can be pressed onto the fan duct. The whole tool head should hold tight without any screws. Next, we screw the rod carriage and the fan duct together. We do this by screwing two M3 6mm screws at the holes over the C-bracket. Next up, we connect the connector plate to the fan duct. Here, you should see a small gap between them. This gap is normal. To avoid vibrations, the rod carriage and the fan duct are designed to stay under static tension. We connect both of them with two M3 6mm screws. Last but not least, we come to the two blower fans. Here, it's important that the fans are pressed into the two holes provided on the top of the fan duct so that they close flush and airtight. Again, use two M3 6mm screws to attach the fans to the fan duct. Tip, you could replace one 6mm screw with a 35mm one. This ensures that all cables are bundled on the front side of the tool head and prevents them from reaching into the fans blocking them. Yeah, this is it. The tool head is finished. This was it for today. Subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon to be reminded when the next part of this assembly guide is coming. If you want to support this project and get in touch with me, you might consider a subscription at Patreon. There, I write a development diary for the 100 on a daily basis. So, if you like to get access to unreleased beta parts and want to help me by testing them and giving feedback, I would appreciate a subscription at Patreon. Another way to support this project would be to hit the like button and comment on this video to help me to be visible on the YouTube algorithm for suggesting this video to other people. So that's it for today, stay tuned for more content and now get out of here.